Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1067 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Jeff. He is the father of a child with type 1 diabetes. He was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, but has spent the last 25 years living in Sweden. And because I'm mostly devoid of any culture, I've called this episode Bork, Bork, Bork. While you're listening, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you'd like to get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs, you can with your first order at drinkag1.com slash juicebox. You can save 40% off of your entire order at cozyearth.com when you use the offer code juicebox at checkout. And you can really help me by subscribing to the show in whatever audio app you're listening in. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, doesn't matter. If you're listening please subscribe or follow and set up your auto downloads so you never miss an episode. Last thing, definitely check out the private Facebook group Juice Box Podcast Type 1 Diabetes. We're approaching 44,000 members. All we're missing is you. Today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next Gen Blood Glucose Meter. Get the most accurate meter I've ever held at Contour Next dot com slash juice box. The podcast is also sponsored today by Omnipod. Omnipod.com slash juice box. Learn more about the Omnipod Dash and the Omnipod 5. There are links in the show notes and links at juiceboxpodcast.com to Omnipod, the Contour Next Gen, and all of the sponsors. My name is Jeff. I'm born and raised in Seattle, Washington. Um, I've lived in Sweden for just over half of my life. I have three kids. My son is 19. My daughter is 16. Excuse me. My son is 20. My daughter is six. My oldest daughter is 16. And my youngest daughter, who's T1, is seven and a half. And her name is Madeline. We call her Maddie. 2016, seven and a half. Maddie has type one, seven and a half. Um, how long have you lived in Sweden? Uh, just about 25 plus years. So I've been here about half my life. Wow. What made you uh, move? What made me move here? Yeah. Well, when I was a senior in high school, there was a Swedish exchange student uh, at the school that year, and we became friends. We eventually dated, and she moved obviously back to Sweden uh, after her year. And a year later, I came to Sweden as an exchange student and lived with her and her family. Um, our d- relationship continued to develop. Um, we ended up getting engaged, ended up getting married a couple of years afterwards, um, lived back in the U.S. for four years to get college educations, and then moved here permanently in 96. So I've lived here since then. Uh, you and she are no longer together, or you are? She's my first strike. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you because your son played baseball, you know all the oh. all the baseball terms. I, I get three strikes. I'm out. Oh, I don't, oh. Um, I don't do that stuff anymore. <laughs> Jeff, you've been divorced three times. Yeah, hey, yeah. I'm like a um, you know like a celebrity pro at it. I think I'm probably better at signing divorce papers than most people are signing most other documents. So yeah. Are all three of these children from one of these ladies, or are they spread out? Uh, no, <laughs> um, they're two from Strike Two and one from Strike Three. <laughs> I'm just going to make a note here. I don't know any other way to do it. I'm going to put number two and number three next to the children <laughs> on my notes um, so in case it comes up for some uh, autoimmune stuff. Okay. <laughs> well, three lucky girls. So uh, <laughs> have they formed a club yet, the- by the way, the three of them? are <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of, but there could be a Facebook group. Oh, yes. they're. Definitely a Facebook group with three people, and it just just, just 
It's just called oh, I, I, I Escaped Jeff. And there's three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's what it is. It's not really something I'm obviously not something I'm proud of. But, you know, life throws you curveballs and all kinds of stuff. So it's just the way it is. Yeah, Jeff, with those uh, cur- one. When those curveballs come at you, you're supposed to move when those curveballs come. <laughs> you got to stop letting them keep hitting you in the leg, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so two two of the strikes were not my initiative, and one of the strikes was my initiative. So I don't take credit for all of it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just a passenger a couple of times. All right. That's right. So, um, okay. So you, uh, you're... Maddie, seven and a half. How old was she when she was diagnosed? So it was in February of last year. So February 22. So she was six and a half when she was diagnosed. So oh. we're just a, just over a year and about 15 months in. Yeah, I was going to say that's not long at all. Uh, no. Just for context, were you married to her mom at that time or no? No. 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 Strike three and uh, was about just over three years ago. I see. All right. So, yeah. What was so? I, I think the reason that it, I was so excited for you to be on the podcast is because the uh, type one is fairly prevalent in your part of the world. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, so Finland has the highest rate of new cases of type one per thousand under the age of eighteen. Hmm. See, did I say that right in the right logical order? And I think, if I remember right, I'm going to try and like regurgitate some some numbers here. I think the number is like 5.6 per 1,000 youths. Hmm. Um, and Sweden is number two with like 5.4. I'm not exactly sure on those numbers, but because it was about a year ago that I got them. But um, I don't think they changed too much over time. Mm-hmm. So Sweden and Finland are number one and number two. Okay. In the, I'm just, I'm doing some looking right now in my stats. I'm just going to go back to like Mm -hmm. the beginning of 2022, I guess, just to give a little bit of a sample size here. And yeah, if I go back to January, 2022 and just run my downloads, one, two, three, four, Mm -hmm. Sweden is the sixth most downloaded country that listens to the show. Mm -hmm. It lags behind the top. The top four are are the chunk of my downloads. Uh, Mm -hmm. But, but then Ireland, Sweden, Germany, New Zealand, uh, Saudi Arabia are are the next. So um, it's just interesting. Is is Finland in your top 10 or your top 15? uh, Let me look. Uh, I'll read through it. I'm just curious because they're the, the Finnish language is just, it's like a different, completely different language group, and it's not related at all to English. So there's and no my way personal experience is that Finns aren't as good at English as Swedes are at English. Well, that makes so sense. That's why I'm a little bit curious. Yeah, let me look. U.S., Canada, Australia, U.K., Ireland, Sweden, Germany, New Zealand, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Israel, Norway, Spain, South Africa, Switzerland, Austria, Denmark, France, Mexico, Egypt, I'm See, going. Finland's not even on there. Yeah, I'm heading into the 21 Netherlands, You're Bulgaria, India, Italy, Hong Kong, Romania, Portugal, Belgium, Singapore, China. No, it's in the first 30. I don't see it. I'm jumping no. ahead now. Yeah. So Finland and Estonia and Hungary are uh, in the same language group. Okay. And it's actually a very different language group than like the Western European I languages see. and stuff. So if I spoke and Finnish, you think I'd be huge? In diabetes, I do. I yeah. actually, I do. Yeah, because they're very like digitalized, like we are here in Sweden. Hmm. Uh, lots of people listen to podcasts. There's everybody has like super high tech stuff. Isn't that like, crazy? Finland, Sweden, and Norway are very similar, and I think it's interesting that I think Norway is the third ranked country after Finland and Sweden, mm-hmm. or at least it's in the top five in terms of new cases in Sweden. Swedish and Norwegian are basically mutually intelligible languages. So it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that Norway is, is up there wow. um, in the top 20. Excellent. That's really something. Yeah. So your child is, I mean, how do you think of it? Your, your ex is Swedish, I am assuming. 
Yes, that's right. Maddie's uh, mom is Swedish. Okay. So is there any autoimmune on her side or your side? My daughter Arden has been wearing an Omnipod since she was four years old, and she is now 19. That is every day wearing an Omnipod for the last 15 years. I think what we love most about Omnipod is that it doesn't have any tubing. But, uh, I don't know. Is that the thing you love most about it? You don't have to take it off to swim or bathe. You can leave it on for activity and exercise. It's small. I don't, it, I mean, it's so easy to put on, right? To fill it and to put it on is just, it takes us no time at all. Um, yeah, I guess it's hard to figure out what my favorite thing about Omnipod is. I guess I'll just say that my daughter loves it. It's easy and it's worked for her for so many years. It's just such a friend in all of this. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. You can check your coverage there for your insurance uh, or take a test drive, right? Would you like a free trial of the Omnipod? You can do that there as well. And you can just get started. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Now you have a decision to make. Do you want the Omnipod Dash, which is an insulin pump? where you make all the decisions, or do you want the Omnipod 5? Now, the Omnipod 5 is the first and only tubeless automated insulin delivery system to integrate with the Dexcom G6, and it's available for people with type 1 diabetes ages 2 years and older. It features smart adjust technology, and it's going to help you to protect against highs and lows both day and night. That's an algorithm-based system, making decisions about insulin, giving it, and taking it away. It's pretty damn cool. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box links in the show notes links at juiceboxpodcast.com when you use those links you're supporting the production of the podcast and helping to keep it free and plentiful as you heard earlier this episode of the podcast is sponsored by the contour next gen blood glucose meter but when you get a contour meter what you're really getting is their test strips contour next test strips feature remarkable accuracy as part of the Contour Next blood glucose monitoring system. They're the number one branded over-the-counter test strips. And they, of course, have second-chance sampling. Second-chance sampling can help you to avoid wasted strips. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Near the top of the page, you'll see a Buy Now button. It's bright yellow. When you click on that, you'll get eight options of places online to buy contour meters and test strips. Walmart.com, Amazon, Walgreens, CVS Pharmacy, Meyer, Kroger, Target, Rite Aid. These are all links you'll find at my link. Linkity link. Links but a link, blink, blink, link. I'm just kidding. Head over there. Now, won't you please? Listen, the contour meters are incredibly accurate. They are simple to use. They are easy to hold, easy to read, and they have a bright light for nighttime testing. Part of me wants to say that the second chance sampling is the biggest deal, but honestly, it's the accuracy. These meters are accurate. And I know a lot of people like to think, well, I have a CGM. I don't need a meter. You do. You need a meter. You need it to be accurate. You deserve it to be accurate. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Take a look at the Contour Next Gen and the other meters available from Contour. When you use my links, you're supporting the production of the show and helping to keep it free and plentiful. Well, this is kind of interesting. Um, and I wanted to, this is one of the things that I wanted to share. Maddie's mom has a son who's nine, eight years older than Maddie. Okay. And he also has type one. That boy's father's family has no, has no autoimmune. My family has no autoimmune. The autoimmune or the type one needs to come from the mom, but she doesn't, oh, well, doesn't need to, but you think it would. So half siblings have type one. Um, there is no other type one in the mom's family, but there's some other autoimmune issues. Do you know what they are? So yeah, bipolar. That's the one that I'm like definitely aware of. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of the other medical histories of the family, but there's another thing that came up in a diabetes um, like symposium that I was at the other day uh, that I thought was really interesting and kind of had to do with this. So to kind of run some numbers for Sweden, what the, the T1 community is like here. So the population of Sweden is 10 and a half million. There are 8,000 youths with type one in Sweden. 
though not a lot, but still quite a few for the size of the population. In the city that I live in, there's a population of 160,000 people. There are 240 type one children. And when I say children, I mean under the age of 18 Mm -hmm. in the city that I live in, whereof Madeline and her brother are one of five sibling pairs in the community, in the city here. Wow. So pretty uncommon to have siblings. Yeah. If you take it into the big, the big picture. Well, does a lot of the population get diagnosed after 18? I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I wish I knew more about the adult type one community here, but I, I don't really have any connection to it. I, I don't know any, any adult right. who have type one. I, I know a guy who has type two, but I mean, that's confirmed. That's not the same thing. Um, yeah. He is insulin dependent. However, uh, he uses insulin with his breakfast, but that's it. I don't know anybody else. When Madeline's half brother was diagnosed eight years ago, um, the doctors talked about a surge that summer. Uh, they had more new cases, confirmed cases of type one that summer than any other time period prior to that. Mm-hmm. This is after COVID. So it was like a four. No, this is before COVID. Before this was COVID. back in two thousand. Well, eight years ago. What would that oh, be? Oh, two thousand fifteen, okay. sixteen, something like that. I'm looking here online. It says type one diabetes is one of the most common chronic diseases that affect children in Sweden. The majority are diagnosed mm-hmm. between the ages of 10 and 14. The number of children among children, oh, excuse me, the number of diagnosis among children is increasing and the percentage is among the highest in the world. Sweden is second after Finland. That's right. I mean, do you have any idea why that is? Well, <clears throat> um, so I went about a month ago, not even a month ago, two and a half weeks ago or so, I went to this annual diabetes symposium here in the city that I live in. Um, they hadn't done it for a couple of years because of COVID. So this was the first time back. So it was well visited. And one of the things that they talked about was one of the things that I've spoken with my daughter's doctors about as well, the endo, is that like what is this from? And, and they, they don't know. The only thing that they can kind of like stretch it to is um, the idea of lack of sunlight. So like two little vitamin D is what it is, right? Hmm. So when my older kids were newborns up until they were, I think, two years old, we would give them vitamin drops every day. Um, they were called AD drops, so vitamin A and vitamin D drops. They've been researching this whole thing with the cause of type one, the high cause of type one here been for a long time. And that's one of the things that they think might be a contributing factor is the lack of sunlight. Are, are these vitamin drops very common for children? All children take them here. Yeah. Yeah. All do. So it wasn't, I wasn't like picked out for, for some reason though, mm-hmm. but it's, that's just standard procedure. All kids get it here. Wow. When they're little. All right. I have to tell you something funny before we move on, Jeff. I Googled Sweden type 1 diabetes just to see what I could find. Someone misspelled the word sweets in their Google thing. So it says, can diabetics can diabetics eat Swedes? And that, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that came up as part of the, as part of the, in, the, in the a, search. <laughs> in the zombie apocalypse, they will. <laughs> well, no, I mean, if you read all the information about it, obviously it just meant sweets but it's kind of funny oh no wait oh no excuse me i'm wrong swedes are a vegetable (laughs) how crazy look we're learning together jeff swede plays plays the role of white potatoes but does not have as many carbohydrates that break down simple sugars a swede is a get the hell out of here hold on a second i'm sorry we're swede rutabaga comes up oh rutabaga rutabaga (laughs) rutabaga or a swede is a root vegetable how about that oh i think i've heard about that once like turnips Um, yeah something like that unbelievable i just thought it was a typo all right (laughs) now we all learned something swedes are rutabaga rutabaga is a root none of us are eating it (laughs) so (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Imagine there's a whole crops of these things being made and brought to grocery stores all over the world, and people are like, "What is that? <laughs> what, am yeah, I, what, what is that? What am I making with it?" All right, I'm sorry. Just one more step, Jeff. What are we making with it? Can, can I just go to the candy department and get my Swedish fish? <laughs> <laughs> rutabaga recipes, roasted rutabaga recipes. 13, 13 best ways to cook with rutabaga. There you go. It's like stew. You can make noodles out of it. Hash. Au gratin. Mashed rutabaga with sour cream and dill. Sweet meg nut. Wait. Swede nutmeg cake with brown butter frosting. Rutabaga soup. Hey, you know, no one's eating this. If I get one email. Your, your coming someone, weekend is saved. You've got the recipe. Go <laughs> I, know, for it. I know what I can do. Here's french fries <laughs> with them. All right, I don't buy into this. If I get one email that someone's like, I regularly cook with rutabagas, I'll be amazed. Well, you have you have your you have your uh, your Nordic uh, groupings up in Minnesota there. Maybe maybe you'll get something from there. I'm waiting. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, what are the signs that Maddie has? Signs when she was diagnosed. Yeah. What What did you see that made you think? Yeah. So that's also one thing I, I really wanted to share because I mean I've obviously listen to like most of your episodes and I, I haven't quite heard a diagnosis story quite like Madeline come close a couple of times where people catch it early. Um, but not quite as early as we caught hers. So I just kind of wanted to share that a little bit. Yeah, please. Um, so in the fall of 21, Madeline got a urinary tract infection and she got penicillin for it. And I, we didn't think that much of it. I mean, her mom's had lots of those. So we just, you know, take penicillin and on you go. I'm a skier, uh, alpine skier. I spend my winters in the mountain skiing, and I have a, a, a small little like, camper that I put up at a ski area every year. Mm-hmm. And so Madeline and I would spend our weekends uh, in the camper skiing. And I mean, you can imagine they're pretty close quarters. They're, they're small, and we have a, there's a little like a porta potty thing in there. I don't know what you call it. And so she would do her business in there. And like, you don't open the latch, you keep the latch closed until you're done. And then you open the latch and the key runs down into this holder thing underneath the camper. And so we're there one weekend and I'm like, ah, you know, our he just smells strong. And so we had gone up on Thursday, we were coming home on Sunday. And for some reason, I can't remember why, but I was supposed to leave Madeline with her mom that Sunday evening. So I left her at her mom's and I said, um, I said, hey, can you just take her by the the, the local clinic and, and run a urine uh, test on her? Because I think she might be getting a, an infection again. She's like, yeah, you know, that's no problem. So Monday they went in, they left the urine sample, it came back negative. And the nurses were like, well, that's kind of weird. Wait 48 hours and, you know, do it again. So they went back on Wednesday, did it again, and it also came back negative. So they, that sets like that kicks in a protocol of a couple other tests that they do mm-hmm. where one of them was that they, they do a stick in your finger and they um, actually take a urine sample and send it away to have it tested. So it came back and, and her blood sugar was elevated or the finger stick blood sugar was elevated. Uh, so you're going to have to, you might have to get your calculator out. I only know the Swedish number systems or the European systems, I guess. All right, I'm ready. And we have, so four to 10 is our target range here, right? Which I guess is like 70 to 180 for you. But she came back, the blood sugar thing came back with 11 in her finger. We all know from listening to your podcast that, you know, you can eat a pizza and drink two liters of Coke and you can get your blood sugar to go up, but then it comes back again. So we thought, well, maybe it's just that. Mm-hmm. But when it, when that happened then, because she was elevated, the doctors wanted her to come back again in a couple of days and again in a couple of days. So it actually took them a couple of days to like really start to get the idea that she might have diabetes, um, but they weren't sure. Um, in fact, the other day I was looking through her journal and it says in the journal, like unlikely to have diabetes. Like that's actually a doctor's comment in there. It was so early. Even um, though they even, didn't, even though her brother has type one. Yes. And it's, it's actually noted in all the posts in her journal, brother, half brother has type one. 
Yeah, but the doctors just were like, "No, we don't know. We can't confirm this yet." Hmm. That seems misguided. I have to be honest. I mean, an eleven blood sugar is 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 two hundred. It's you know, it's higher. It's, than, high. it's yeah. high. It's higher than you should be able to get your blood sugar if your pancreas is 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 working properly. Yeah. Yeah. So then, like, they went into some other clinics. Like, we're just doing this out in like the local community doctor's office where we're at and they then they sent them into the clinics here in town which are like they have a lot more advanced equipment and stuff so they started and then they did an a1c test on her Mm -hmm. and you're gonna have to help me on this as well i have no idea like numbers are in in the american equivalent but 43 um i think it's a 6.1 was her a1c on february 8th Hmm. She had, and a, that's basically she was checked into the hospital. Wait, then, a forty for obser- a forty three A one C. Yeah, man, my 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 calculator doesn't go that high. So no, 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 uh, no. But I mean, like the the Swedish equivalent of like we use a different scale for the A one Cs here, and, and I I've only found one thing on the internet that converts it. I oh, can't no find kidding. any other thing. Yeah, so. What I found the conversion to be is a 6.1. I see. So our A1C when it was February 8th was 6.1. Gotcha. 11 days later, her A1C was 6.6. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. Should there be room for variation? Like, can an A1C read wrong when they test it? Do you have any experience with that? Have you heard anything about that? Well, Jenny always says that an A1C is an average of three months, but it's heavily weighted towards the time closest to when you're taking the test. So, I mean, could she have had a whole week of, like, normal blood sugars that would have made it go down a little bit? That that doesn't seem unreasonable. Well, between the – so in those 11 days, it went up from 6.1 to 6.6. Or or I'm sorry, or vice versa. Yeah, like she also could have had less help from her pancreas for a week, and then it could have ranged up. That doesn't sound unreasonable. Yeah, because then it did go down again. Um, Three weeks later, it was actually lower. But then we had started uh, administering insulin to Mm -hmm, her. mm Mm-hmm. It just sounds like a so, an average honeymoon of there's some help, then there isn't, then there is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but and, and this is also something that I wanted to share with you because of this, like her A1Cs over the last, well, basically exactly a year, I think are, are an interesting scale, are interesting to think about in terms of what management gear we had. So... When we started, when we got the official diagnosis on February 19th that she had A1 or that she had type 1, that's when we got the the antibodies Mm -hmm. test back where they confirmed. And it took them a while to get that. So we only have one lab here in Sweden. Um, It's way down in the south of Sweden. So any blood tests that are done anywhere in the country get transported down to this lab at the very, very bottom of the country. Mm. And that lab is obviously, as what you just said, you know, it was very high in the world uh, in terms of new cases. They're rushed with work. They got a lot to do to test all these things. So it took them a couple of days to get it back. Like they couldn't just do it on site or anything. So it took a while. So they started us with uh, a Libra one and pens when her A1C was 6.6. Right. And by exactly two months later, so on the 12th of April, her, her A1C was 6.5. So she hadn't really, I think she was still honeymooning pretty hard then. Yeah. Um, she was only using 11 units a day. Mm-hmm. In, that's um, both with the long acting and the short acting. And then fast forward three, three months to the middle of June. I guess it's only two months, middle of June. Then we'd switched over to the Libra 2. Um, but we got her on a pump on the dash. And so on the middle of June, her A1C was 6.8. So it had gone up a little bit more. And then after the summer, so in September, um, she was holding steady at 6.8. Then the last reading that we have, so we put her on a Dexcom on, on the, I think like mid November. And on December 8th, 
Uh, so what, about nine months in, I guess, then? nine, 10 months in, her A1C was 6.9. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is where everything changed. Okay. Um, so the Dexcom and the Dash together, like they changed everything for us. And I, I really want to like, I want to share this because there's so many people who use these things and they get such better results. Her A1C from December 8th until February 10th, which was her one year, went from 6.9 to 6.2. It's a nice which reduction. for me, that's a nice reduction. Yeah. Uh, that's a nice downswing. So I was really happy about that. So we have a target here in Sweden. They set a target, like what they want people to strive for, for their A1C, and that's 6.5. Like they say, if you can keep a 6.5, then that's good. And they don't, they want less than 18% lows and they want less than 20% highs. So they want you to stay, like there's Facebook groups here called 5.5. That's where they want your blood sugar to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, less than 18% lows is, I find that to be a high number, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, they want, they want, obviously they want like no extreme lows, but they want it. I mean, that's like they say, like, that's what your max should be, like, from any given A1C to the next. Like, don't have more than 18%. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, I I, I would like this. I'd like to see you have fewer lows than 18% of your of your readings be be lows. You know what I mean? It's a little, yeah, yeah, it seems high to me. But um, so at at our one year, we did an A1C and she had less than 4% lows. That's great. So. Yeah, so we were we were doing good, um, and she had, I think she was seventy two percent in range, um, no extreme highs. So, and obviously, like your Facebook group and your podcast was the one of the biggest contributing factors to this. Our what I consider to be our success, but I can, I remember so vividly. We would go in for these quarterly meetings or, you know, every other month meetings and they would put this graph up um, and they'd look, okay, and now we're going to adjust her basal here and adjust her basal there. I kept thinking to myself, I want to do that graph. I don't want to wait two months um, to have to go into the doctor's office to see that graph. And then I listened to your episode with the, uh, what was it, the Ninja IQ with Jeremy, where he goes through the AGP report in three weeks. We got her dialed in between four point five and seven on her blood sugar. Yeah. Wow. We jumped from about fifty six percent in range to up over seventy percent. Wow. That's and we've amazing. stayed there. We've stayed there since then. Good for you. Even though she's even though she's had the stomach flu, which threw her off for three weeks and we had crazy numbers. And two weeks ago she broke her leg, she got oh. a spiral fracture in her right leg. Which I thought was kind of interesting because that messed with our numbers. Your body, I, I think your body sends out all kinds of hormones, including lots of adrenaline and stuff when you go through that kind of acute pain. Sure. Um, and so she, like for the first time in three months, her blood sugar went up to 18, which is a really high number. And, and her mom said, I, I, I just couldn't get it down. Like I, it would go down insulin. So she had to just kind of wait and let it float down. Like when the pain subsided, the adrenaline stopped flowing. Yeah. And then her blood sugar would just kind of float down. Adrenaline's crazy how it hits. Um, yeah. Do you and your uh, ex, do you guys agree on how to manage? Um, yes and no. Uh, that's also something I wanted to talk about because we have, like, we share Madeline 50% of the time. That's kind of sounded like weird to share. But Madeline is with us 50% each. So we are on a, on a seven-day rolling schedule. In terms of doing a lot of like the programming of her basal program and stuff in the dash, I've done a lot of that myself based on listening to your podcast and asking the doctor her endo for help and stuff. She had up until December 8th, like our, our appointment where everything changed there, um, she had her own basal program. Uh, and I remember that when we were there and I said well, I was going to leave Madeline with her. I said, oh, don't forget to change the basal program to yours. And the doctor looked at her and the doctor looked at me and he looked back at her and he said, don't change from Jeff's basal program. Leave it on her, leave it on his. And that's the one we've been dialed in on since then. 
Now that's been working so well for us. Um, and that's solely because I was using the AGP report like every two to four days. And I would make a small adjustment and I'd wait two days, make a small adjustment, wait two days, you know, just like Jeremy said to do, just like you're supposed to do with that. And it just is amazing how well it works. It's yeah. really, really great. That's And what a win, by the way, Jeff, in the doctor's office, finally being told you're right. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, I mean, well, think, think about, think about where strike three is coming from. I mean, she's been taking care of her son's diabetes for eight years. I mean, she's pretty routine in this. Yeah. She knows what she's doing. Well, my next, and, uh, my next question was going to be, has anything that you've done with Madeline made its way to her half brother? Not that I know of, not directly anyway, because when he was, he's 16 now, when he was 13, he basically took over his own management Okay. and, and kind of said, you know, mom and dad, you don't have to get involved in this. Mm -hmm. And it's been, I mean, he's, he's not doing too bad, but he's not doing great. Um, in fact, the doctor said to Madeline at the last appointment, he said, you know, Maddie, I want you to go tell your brother that he needs to have as good a one C as you do. <laughs> so does the half brother see you as a step parent? Not anymore. He did for the 10 years that we lived together. Okay. I was a step dad for sure. And that's another thing um, that I've, you know, being in a Facebook group and you know, there's when I joined a Facebook group, there was only 23,000 people. Now what? What are the numbers now? 35,000, 36,000? Oh, I don't, that's unimportant to brag about these things. <laughs> um, but I, I think, it's huge. Yeah, I think we're about to get to 38. Yeah, yeah, that's gigantic. Anyway, but you see you see posts in there a lot about shithead dads who don't take care of their, their kids when they're with, you know, when they're with them and the moms are all antsy and nervous when the kids are with their fathers and i get that because those fathers in there aren't doing a good job but there's got to be fathers out there that are also doing a good like i am jeremy is a great example too jeff you know i mean you... yeah and i've seen some other names in there and i'm like wow you guys know what you're doing yeah uh, there's a couple other guys that make some really good posts in there <laughs> one thing i thought about a couple weeks ago i was like i wonder if scott realizes how big his hair is <laughs> <laughs> my my weight my, my what your harem <laughs> you've got quite the following of women scott <laughs> i've never thought of it that way um i've never <laughs> once said to my wife be nice to me or i will just go just go to my corner <laughs> find a lady who would be appreciative of these things that i'm good at <laughs> <laughs> no so but to kind of bring it back to to when i was a stepdad to madeline's half brother his mom didn't really let me get too involved in his care. Um, sometimes I would go down and check on him at the night during the nights and, you know, you know, here, take some, take some sugar tablets and, and fall back to sleep. But I, I mean, honestly, when Madeline got diabetes, I didn't know anything. I really didn't know anything. Right. I didn't know what an A1C was. I didn't know the difference between a, a dash and a pen. I didn't. So I went on a serious crash course. Um, that's also another thing that I, I just wanted to share was so <laughs> kind of a crazy story. So back up to the weeks before Madeline's diagnosis, so I, I had bought an airline ticket to the States to visit my cousin in California. And the day that Madeline's mom called me to tell me that he likely has type one were being admitted to the hospital, I was sitting at the gate at the airport to get on my plane to the U S Oh wow! and I said to her, I said, do I need to walk away from the gate? And she said, no, it's okay. Go, but like program yourself that when you get back, you're going straight to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So when I came back uh, home, I went straight, straight to the hospital and spent a couple of days there with her just to do all the, the educating stuff. Cause I was green. I didn't know what I was doing most totally green yeah and so even uh, though your stepson for that time had type one you just weren't that involved in it five years yeah we lived in the same house and 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 i say you know uh i wasn't let into his care uh i would have been willing to learn more and stuff but the mother was pretty restrictive and and didn't want to mm -hmm. didn't want to let go of the of the control and the care side of it yeah um and and it's, I mean, 
it's not easy to have your be responsible for your kid for a week and then let him go for a week mm. um, and then get him again a week later. That's a, that's a, that's not a real easy thing to, to oh, do. Of course not. So. Plus, I don't think she was that sure about you. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> She was still deciding. It was only five years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you you mentioned uh, Omnipod and Dexcom. Are those things that are readily available where you live, or are you buying them somewhere else? So here's another thing that I, I just – this is also one of the things that I, I wanted to share um, because I believe that when you when you know of, the, of an alternative, you can, like, kind of deal with your own situation a little bit better. So you guys in the U.S., you have this whole phenomenon of insurance and insurance companies can dictate, you know, what gear you have or what management tools you have and all that kind of stuff. We have socialized medicine here. Mm. So everyone, regardless of age and everything you need for diabetes is paid for by the government. Wow. So, yeah, I've even seen like on the Facebook group, somebody posted, yeah, there's uh, the remove little sachets, you know, that you use to get the, the glue off your body. Like yeah. those are on sale on, on Amazon. Go buy them. Right. Wow. We get, we get that for free. We don't pay for anything. Mm. Like nothing. Um, I have a whole cabinet of stuff in the kitchen and I don't have to hoard because I don't have to think about my economy. I just go down to the, the pharmacy and, get new ones when I need it. If it's run out, if they're, if it's done in her, I can't think of the word of it, the word, this is kind of a weird phenomenon with me. You know, I've learned a lot of words in Swedish and I can't always translate them into English. It's, it's, kind of weird it's interesting. I, I speak to a lot of people who are, you know, don't have English as their first language. And there's, a, mm -hmm. there's, there's always a moment where they go, I'm, I, I can't find the word for this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, in fairness, Sweden has a third of the population of Texas. So, yep. yeah, yeah, it's probably so it's the size the size of California, 10 million in population. Kind of mm -hmm. give an idea of a reference. Is it pretty spread out? Yes. I, I what is they what do they say? Like three fourths of the population lives in a third, the southern third of the country. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, OK, because it's a that's a quarter of the population of California. So mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting, mm -hmm. but I mean, still, yeah. I don't know if it can, if it works, there is part of me that's like, why can't somebody scale it? You know, I mean, if it works, yeah. it works, right? I've, I've had that discussion a lot with people over the years. Why would, you know, would the first, the Swedish political system work and, and would the, the socialized medicine work? And I'm just not sure that it would work in a country as big as the U.S. Was yeah. it 36? 360 million people or something like that. I, I don't know. I think that might just be too big. I don't know. What's your tax? What's your tax rate? What do you tax? I pay 33% income tax. 33%. So that's, that's a percentage that I think here would be, I, I can look it up, but I think that would be pretty indicative of making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to get the 33% here. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, so that's going to, so you pay a higher tax percentage that we do generally speaking but you know we get quite a lot for it i mean the socialized medicine is pretty impressive yeah um i actually i didn't like i said earlier i didn't know i don't know any adults with type one so i actually posted on, on the swedish facebook group uh, for kids and i said hey do, do adults pay for any management stuff here in sweden and they said and like several people immediately wrote back no hmm. they don't pay for anything what you do pay for is you pay like a twenty five dollar copayment when you go to the doctor for your for your annual um, endo or something like that. Yeah, well, the doctor needs beer money, so um, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we we have uh, our tax rates range from ten percent to thirty seven. So it's right. 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, 37. So I was kind of close with my guess, um, but yeah. yeah, then that you know, obviously goes up as you make more and more money, but is it for there? And it does here as well. It, oh, does, it does here as well. Oh, okay. The more you make here, like you can, you can go all the way up to, I think like even 48. No, no, I wouldn't even work. Jeff, if you took 48% <laughs> of my money, I'd say, Oh, I'm homeless. Now you take care of me. 
you're not getting any effort from Scott anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure about those numbers, but I mean, it, it gets, it goes up high, but that's a really small percentage of the population. Yeah. And no, I mean, I'm there's a lot of people who like say no to raises because they don't want to move up. I don't care how wealthy practice. that person is. They're banging them to their head right on a wall as we speak right now. 48%. That's all I would think and about. When they, I think when they reach that bracket, they probably move to another country with a with a better tax. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Switzerland, <enough>. here I come. <laughs> my kids, my kids are gonna get diabetes, and you're taking half of my income. Terrific, <laughs> absolutely yeah. terrific. What a what a what a visitor's guide it must be. Come to Sweden, <laughs> get diabetes. We'll take your money. But hey, everything so, will be free. Does it does it work out? Does it work out, Jeff? Like, do you stop and think about the money you put out for, and then the money you're saving by not putting it? Is it kind of a wash? Um, you know, I think we've got it really good here. So you don't have to think about, I mean, obviously I'm like tunnel vision a little bit because my daughter's type one, but I don't, I have five weeks paid vacation every year as a minimum. Hmm. Um, my kids, if they want to go to university, they pay like a couple hundred dollars a year. Um, usually they can get paid to go to the university if they set it up right. So there's a lot of things that are way different. Uh, I hear all the time about how much Americans, like how, well, how much you spent on, on your kids' college educations. And it's just astronomical sum. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, for the same job, you probably make twice as much money in the U.S. But mm -hmm. you need to because your cost of living is a lot higher. Yeah. I'd be embarrassed to tell you what I paid to send my son to school. Honestly, it's terrible. <laughs> it's and, probably more than what I make in a decade. It's, so it's, oh God, it's if, it, if, if, if we'll, we'll talk afterwards, cause I want to know <laughs> because if that's, <laughs> if, if that's true, I'm, I'm more upset. Um, like Ard Arden's is significantly cheaper than Cole's was. And still I'm okay. flabbergasted by how much money I send for her. So. So here's another thing that you, if you want to, if you want to look at more things in the equation. So what do we get for the money that we pay in taxes? Well, we get 450 days to be home paid with our newborn children. Hmm. 450 days, Scott. Think about that. Yeah, I wouldn't go back. To that's not 457 days in a row. Like you can break it up. I, I see that. So. Here, here's my, here's how I'm wired. I want to hear more about this. But if you gave me that much time off, I wouldn't go back to work. <laughs> well, you know. Um, you keep pumping out the kids and you don't have to go back to work. I mean, psychologically, I don't believe I could. I, I, I think I'd be like, I can't go do that anymore. I've, I'm accustomed <laughs> to another lifestyle. Okay, so a lot of days off if I make a baby. What else? Um, well, the, the college education. Yeah, free, it for sounds free. like. Yeah. Um, for free, yeah. Um, socialized medicine. Um, we have huge subsidies on all kinds of other stuff as well. Yeah, I mean, I it's interesting. My so strike two, right? She's actually Dutch. Um, she moved up here, worked for an American guy at the hospital, and did research in the field of psychology. He had lived here for her at that time. He had lived here for like thirty years, and he's and he was um, a PhD doctor in psychology, working with um, pain research. Mm -hmm. That's a huge field internationally, obviously, um, and he. We had dinner with him one evening and we talked back and forth about, you know, why did, why do you choose to stay in Sweden when you could go to America and make five times what you're making here, or even maybe six or seven times the amount of money. And he said, yeah, but you know, I get five weeks of paid vacation every year. Hmm. I get all the holidays off. I, I work 40 hours a week. I have money every year. Even though I have all this time off, I, I make enough money that I can take my family to America and visit their relatives every year and i and i i get paid to do that it's it's just a different like work environment here yeah you know? no i i i know my my wife works with some some people in europe uh, you know generally speaking and there's times where she's like well we can't get this project done for two weeks because they're on holiday and you know and it sweden shuts down sweden shuts down for i would say from about june no from about the 5th or 10th of July, somewhere in there, the second week of July until the second week of August. So that four week block is you don't get a lot of that done. Yeah, that makes me mental. I haven't had five weeks off in 10 years. Like I just, I just literally get up every day and make this podcast. And then on the weekends, I try to like not die 
so that I can do it again on Monday. <laughs> Just try to try to sleep and rest. I, I've, I've I've heard all about your your scratches and itches. <laughs> <laughs> you need to stay out of your garden. <laughs> well, please, I have to cut the lawn later today. I'm scared. But no, seriously, like we don't take time off. Like like when my wife talks about a gap where she's like can't get something done, it makes people mental here. They're like, you know, I mean, it's work and die. Like, that's pretty much what we do. So yeah. And, and so January you know. of this year, so just a couple of months ago, I was over and visiting my mom in Alaska, and, and was there for my stepfather's uh, memorial service or celebration of life. And I met this gal, and we were talking, and she said, "Yeah, I was sick, and I missed work for two weeks." And I thought, "Wow, that way of phrasing it would never go through my head." I would say, "I was sick for two weeks." Mm-hmm. So you see, there's no reference to work. Yeah. Like her reference was, I was away from work for two weeks. My reference is, I was sick for two weeks. But we, she and I could have been saying the exact same thing, like referring to the same thing. Oh, no, for sure. When you get sick here, you worry about your job immediately. Yeah, yeah. So it's a different, it's a different environment, um, creates a different kind of mentality. And yeah. yeah, I'm not so sure you can, you can slide the one towards the other. We like our five weeks vacation. Yeah, so there's no like, the the killer be killed vibe doesn't doesn't live there. No, mm. no, interesting. No. You know, I, I pay I pay uh, fourteen dollars a month insurance, which is if if for whatever reason I am to become unemployed, I get eighty percent of my salary for a year. Mm. Yeah, through that, a, a national that. insurance policy that costs me fourteen dollars a month. That's something, which is nothing. Obviously, no. nothing. Yeah, that's crazy. My gosh, our, our health insurance costs hundreds of dollars a month, comes out of your check. And then there's another, I think for us, like six or $8,000, it's out of pocket before it starts paying that year. So I probably pay ten or $12,000 a year to insure my kids. And then it's funny, I think of myself as having good insurance. Like, no, no lie, this morning, my brother asked me about a medication and, he, and I'm a medication I'm using and he was thinking of, somebody in his family was thinking of using it. And he said, what do you pay for this? And I said, $24. And he goes, wait, I thought it was like, and he gave me a number. And I said, oh, no, that's my insurance cost, $24. I have good insurance. That's what I said. And now I realize, well, but the, the medication's so expensive without insurance. This, this specific medication, if I, if I used it without insurance, it would cost, I think, $2,000 a month. So... I guess technically, because I'm using my insurance, it's paying for for, for itself. But people who don't use it, ooh, you know, they get yeah. they get run over. Um, yeah. You're paying you're paying just in case, and then something doesn't mm-hmm. happen, and you know, whatever. Uh, but and, okay, so I'm sorry. My original question, I'm still not sure about though. That was like 20 minutes ago. They sell okay. Omnipod and Dexcom are readily available yeah. in Sweden. Yes. 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 So. So this like there's kind of a traditional there's the old school traditional way of of starting in with diabetes. They want you so you you get hooked up with a Libra one basically immediately for children, um, and they want you to do MDI. And at that time, when I knew Madeline's uh, brother had he had a Dexcom and a Dash, and I was like, why don't we just start on that right away? The mm-hmm. doctor's like, well, yeah, you know. Uh, we want you for the first thing. Um, there's she uses only 11 units of insulin a day, which is like not enough to justify using the Omnipod. Uh, but they wanted us to learn so that we would be able to use them later. And in fact, I'm very thankful for that now. When I can look back in retrospect, I'm when I mean, when she's got a sticky high and, and I think the site is bad, um, if it's day three of the pod, I'll pull the pod off and give her an injection. And I wait, you know, 45 minutes for, for the, the numbing thing you put on her arm. Help me. <laughs> wait, the numbing thing you put on her arm? I don't do, I don't, we don't use a numbing thing. You put like a cream on? No, it's not a cream. It's like a, um, it's a band aid that has like this numbing stuff in it. You put it on, you put it on where you're going to set the pod and it will like desensitize that area of skin and you leave it on for half an hour and then you put the pod on and, and you, you really can't feel the annual going in oh she's she's sensitive so we do that that's very nice but i'll use 
What's that? Actually, that's very nice of you. When Arden said it hurt when she was little, I'm like, it'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> it'll go away. Let it go. Um, no, so, so, but I'll always give her an injection. Like, if, you know, if she's floating high and I can't get it down because it's state three, I'll give her an injection and pull the pot off. And, and, and that works really well. And there, there are times when she's at school. So her whole school staff, her resources at school that take care of her, um, mm-hmm. they're all trained with the pens as well. Because if she, if her pod falls off at nine o'clock in the morning, well, I don't want to ditch out of work to go fix that. So they yeah. need to give use the pens for the day. So it, it, it's kind of this thing. And so I'm glad that we have that knowledge and that ability to use it. And She's not afraid of them and yeah. all this kind of stuff. I find it helpful. I take your point, and I, I don't discount it at all. The one thing that you said that that I wanted to respond to was the idea that she was only using 11 units a day, and that would be a waste of the pod. I, I still don't see it that way, I guess. Like, there's still things you can do with an insulin pump you can't do with MDI. And I didn't know that until I had listened to the Ninja IQ episode. But yeah. when I learned that, I was like, yeah, no, don't you dare take my pod away from me. Don't take don't don't do that. So like that, it just is. I mean, yeah, you you gotta understand. It was just a massive game changer. Like getting the understanding of the AGP report and being able to myself go in and make the micro adjustments and just watch her curve flatten out was just like, man. I did my little my little dance lots of times those weeks. Yeah, I, hear I put my little blue cape on and I did my little diggity dance. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I was uh, celebrating the successes on a on, uh, twice a week, watching that curve flatten out. It was it was amazing. That's excellent. Hey Jeff, I know yeah. you have a lot on your list to do, and we've already been talking for an hour. And I don't feel like divorcing you, which I find surprising. But um, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no strike force, Scott. <laughs> just, you have to make up a new sport. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we're getting to the things you wanted to talk about. Um, <laughs> so we don't time go, flies when you're having fun well, i don't want to go so, too yeah long there's yet. a couple <laughs> i don't know if you start getting on my nerves or something you know what i mean i might have to go <laughs> oh my God. well there's there's a couple more things that i want to share that yeah. i i find um maybe useful probably more just interesting so because of finland's high rates and sweden's high rate and both countries have socialized medicine which means all kids have gear they, and, and every single time you go into your endo, you upload everything into this database. Okay. What's it called? Diasend, Diasend or something like that. Mm-hmm. Do you have something like that? I, I've seen that here. Yeah. We don't, uh, we usually go in and they're like, do you have anything to download? We're, we're fine. Just let's get the prescriptions right and get out of here. <laughs> prescriptions, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah right. But, that was the word I was looking for a little while ago. Prescription. Oh, you couldn't, couldn't find, find that find word. It. Oh, okay. Do, they, do you not have them? Head. Well, how do you get? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You get? yeah, okay. yeah. So the endo writes a prescription, puts the whole list of stuff in there. And then when something runs out, we just make a phone call. Hey, can you renew this prescription? Yeah, yeah. And will do it for another year. Well, a year. It's nice. So, yeah. We get lucky if we get yeah. three, three months. Yeah. And then um, then everything is extended a year at a time uh, or based on count. So like the remove little sachets mm-hmm. things. I'll get like two boxes at a time. I don't know how many there are in there, but there's hundreds in the box. So yeah, every couple of years I'll get a new box. Okay. I see. Anyway. So I wanted to go back. So every time a kid goes in for a quarterly checkup or a biannual checkup, all the data from their PDM or whatever is uploaded into a database. That database is all the data from Finland and Sweden. Mm -hmm. So all the kids in Finland and all the kids in Sweden are uploaded into a database. And you can't Google search this database. I asked Maddie's endo about this. It's not a public thing because it's, it's really a, like a secure database needs to be, but all of the management tool companies in the world will ask to get numbers out of this database. So a lot of the statistics that you see and a lot of the data that's used to further develop the gear that we're all using comes out of the Swedish and Finnish database, Hmm. which I find really interesting to know. And that is made possible because I believe because of our relatively small populations and our high percentage of management use. So we're all using electronic devices that 
save all the data and that, that can be loaded up into these databases. So I think that's that's just interesting to know. So and sometimes this is probably where I'm gonna cry. Like when I think about, you know, Maddie's management, you know, my my daughter's type one and our efforts to take care of her are not only helping her, but in a long kind of long shot way through that database, there's lots of kids in the world who have a better day-to-day life thanks to the management tools that are available oh, that sure. are partially developed out of this database. I find that kind of interesting. No, and The world not, is a small place. Yeah. And not just the kids that are alive now and living with type one, but the stuff that's going to happen moving forward, it's going to happen more quickly, Absolutely. more efficiently, you know, uh, algorithms are going to get better and better. And, you know, yep. all that stuff is, I mean, yep. It's moving. So we're we're much. we're at the beginning of of what's actually going to happen. I think. Yeah, uh, it's of- it's very easy to like. You know, it's, I'll, I'll draw a parallel. Maybe I don't need to talk around it. Uh, uh, a management company approached me about managing my me. I don't know. Apparently, I'm 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 some. <laughs> Very low level. I might want to divorce you now. Yeah. I might be. I might be a, a very low level celebrity. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I, I was approached by a management company who said, you know, stuff like we think we can grow the podcast. We think we can, you know, get you speaking engagements, like stuff like that, right? And mm-hmm. so we were having kind of an introductory conversation, and I said, well, the podcast has been up for nine years, but it really just took off about four years ago. And that's a hard thing to wrap your head around that over half of the time I've been doing this was just preamble. You know, Mm. not that it wasn't helping somebody in the first five years, but speaking about scope and scale, it was just preamble getting to it. Like, I don't actually think the podcast is done growing. I think it might just be at a tipping point now, come kind of coming up this year and the next year. And Mm. it's funny when you think about management styles of diabetes you can look back you know and say oh well they you know came up with insulin in the 20s and but yeah but a lot of that's preamble right like a lot of it is like when you think i mean how amazing it is that somebody found insulin i'm not saying otherwise but you know it it was probably catch as catch can for a while and even now there's still people who are like i've been alive with diabetes for this many years and i've been using insulin since and you can't find a rhyme or reason why it worked out for that person you know, uh-huh. it's 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 just in the last, I mean, my opinion, the last 10 or so years when CGMs came and mm-hmm. now, I mean, look at how fast things are moving. You know, 20 years mm-hmm. ago, you were still, it was still a little like, good luck. You know, 30 years ago, they still didn't expect you to live very long. And now we're talking about a technology that came out that a pump is attached to, and now people are getting their insulin without having to do it crazy and that's all just in the last yeah. decade you know so anyway yeah. it's an inflection point it's it's a long lead up a long runway to get to sometimes uh the good part so so yeah and that's interesting and that leads me into something that i also wanted to share so not there's two more things that i want i want to share yeah, of course um, and one of them i'm probably gonna have to go give my go give maddie some juice here in a little bit you're fine she's slowly drifting down we'll we'll see what happens um anyway so i went to this diabetes symposium uh, a couple weeks ago and there was a speaker there who is like one of the most prominent researchers in the type one field in sweden and in fact in the world and uh, he's published uh in scientific journals more than 400 and 70 is it 470 times seven over 700 articles hmm. he's either an author or a co-author too so this is a like a, a central figure in in the research of, of type one obviously the question is where are we when's the cure etc cetera, etc cetera. and he did this long presentation about um why he why why where they are in their research and where he thinks it's going to be in 10 years and he said he, he hopes that they're going to be making some significant breakthroughs in 10 years and, and within the next 10 years. And one of those things that he referred to was the autoimmune um, 
condition of, I think it's called psoriasis or eczema or something. That's a skin condition. Mm -hmm. And he said that they're actually making like real progress in that uh, medical condition now. Um, and that they want to try and use some of the ideas that they're doing with that autoimmune illness and put it into the type 1 diabetes. Okay. Um, and he had this long explanation I thought was interesting about why they think diabetes um, starts in kids. Because um, his, his like central research is, is with children. And so he he explained like he had a he explained like where the pancreas is in the body and why we can't take like tissue samples of it because it's like way down in the, in the deep part of the body. It's like un behind all the other organs. You can't really get to it without messing around with all the other organs on the way in. Mm -hmm. And he said that if you look at the physiology of it, I think it's called the biology of it, there's a tube that goes from the pancreas down into the intestine. That tube is connected to the tube from the gallbladder. And those two things together go down into the intestine where the food leaves the stomach and goes into the, the first section of the intestine where it's actually really broken down. And then you start to pull the nutrition out of it. And he said that, so one of the things that can happen is that the, all the enzymes and the bacteria and stuff from that section of the intestine can go back the other way on accident. So there's a valve that's not working really well. And he said, which I thought was fascinating, he said, so you know that people can have their gallbladders taken out. And I was like, and I, and I was like, wait a minute, Maddie's mom had her gallbladder taken out. And when they took it out, there was over 150 stones in her gallbladder, hmm. um, where most of them were the size of peas or maybe a corn, like a piece of corn. Yeah. But three of them were the size of marble, like say the end of your thumb, like they were huge. Right. And he said that that is a, a consequence of like bacteria and things going where they're not supposed to be. And your body tries to fight them off. And he said, well, what if it doesn't go to the gallbladder and it goes into your pancreas? And your body then has to fight this somehow. Well, in the gallbladder, what it does is it, it, it puts a, it makes a stone out of whatever gets in there. And in the pancreas, your immune system shoots there and takes it, takes it down, right? Well, then it's also taking down the, the, the islets, which produce the T cells, which produce the insulin. Mm. He says, and they think they're hypothesizing about that. This, they think this might be one of the reasons it starts. And I was thinking to myself, okay, so Madeline's mother has two children with type one and herself taking her gallbladder out. I don't know. This could be a reach, big, big, big reach, but I can't stop thinking about it. Like it's just something I chew on a little bit. Yeah. It's fascinating. And the other thing that he said was that when a, babies are born, their pancreas is the size of your little finger. And when you're an adult, it's about the size of an average size banana. And he said, so if this kind of thing is happening where these enzymes or bacteria or whatever are going up into the pancreas when they're babies, then they're affecting a larger percentage of the pancreas than it would in an adult. And he thinks that that might be one of the reasons that it's, there's more cases of type one developing in small children. Hmm. Who's this person? Younger children. His name is Ula Korsgren. His first name is O-L-L-E and his last name is K-O-R-S-G-R-E-N. If you go on Google Scholar and, and search his name, you can see all the articles that he's done. Spell the last name again. K-O-R-S-G-R-E-N. Okay, I have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating stuff. He, I, he went on and on and on. He had graphs, and he was talking about, you know, why, don't, why aren't we working as a society and a medical community, why aren't we working to prevent the onset of type one instead of just treating the symptom of type one? Yeah. Like, why are we passive? Um, and that's an interesting question. Um, why are we, why are we that? And well, we're good at it. Not a lot of people, not a lot of kids, no, no children so far, like no children have died in Sweden from, complications related to type one in over 10 years. That's a long time. Mm. 
So they're good. They're, uh, you guys, so, are, you guys, you guys are good at setting it up. Good at treating it. You make sure people have what they need, and yeah, maybe because of that, yeah. you lose you lose focus on. Is it possible we could just be stopping this ahead of time because we're so right. good? So at care he of was it. talking about what he wants to see in the future is like a higher screening. How can we? So if if there is autoimmune in the family, then we can start screening these families and checking for the antibodies. And how can we then develop ways to avoid more antibodies in a specific person? Huh. Things like that. I thought it was really interesting. And he, he actually said, so like this is supposing it's, it's funded by all the management tool companies. So Dexcom and Omnipod, they were all there. They all had their tables, handing out brochures. And there was probably another 12 or 15 companies there mm-hmm. with all of their gear. And he looked, he looked up in the auditorium, like towards the doors where these people were. And he says, I don't think you'll need those people out there in 10 years. That's a pretty hefty statement um, to make there and then. Mm, but crazy. that's how confident he is in, in what's going on. Yeah. I don't want to give anybody false hopes. I mean, just keep working on what you're doing. But the research community is moving forward for sure. That's excellent. Also, I would be remiss not to point out that these people sometimes need donations to keep going and a lot of what they do is sales too. So it's, it's, yes. it's tough, you know, like it's tough to read through it all. It's, it's incredibly interesting. It makes me wonder why mm-hmm. if I get a, um, I see somebody get a, a pancreas transplant and then they redevelop type one like that, mm-hmm. like, would that be because that valve, you know, that all that process just happened again. Um, right. Well, it's a biological, I guess, like, mistake you know like that valve doesn't close like it's supposed to yeah or open and close like you know super interesting uh, no it's really yeah. I, listen i i never i would never say you know no to anything like people i hope people do all kinds of different research just thinking about like what you just explained from this gentleman just looking at it a different perspective like somebody else could see the same thing and think oh it's obviously this and then their research starts from mm-hmm. there so you need everybody to kind of follow their heart and uh and do the work and and get funded yep. so they can do it it just it's tough because yep. i've been around this long enough to see what i what i kind of term research season comes around and there's suddenly a lot of articles about like oh we got this figured out i got that figured out make a donation to me and like and it's tough because newer diagnosed parents get sucked into it really easily and, sure. and you know and it's tough because you're like well yeah let me give them money and it'll help and I mean, there's a lot of people doing research and, you know, most of them are wrong. (laughs) So like, how do you know, how do you know, how do you you know which one is which, but yeah, but you want it all to go forward. Like I said, I think that that's fascinating what he's laid out, you know, really interesting. Yeah, it was, it was cool to sit there and listen to him. I imagine. Yeah. How long did it go? The talk? It was a full day. Uh, well, the symposium was a full day deal. He spoke for an hour. So, I mean, I just touched on just like maybe 15, 20% of everything that he yeah. said. Yeah, no, that's really something. I, I could regurgitate a lot more, but I thought this was the was the most interesting. Like he went in a lot about. So there's, there are the islets in the, in the pancreas that are shut down by the white blood cells that the body sends there to fight off whatever's happened, the infection that's happened. Well, they think the infection is from the bacteria, from the intestine, the white. But he said, we don't think that the cells are destroyed. We think that they're just kind of put into hibernation. Like anything. So he said, I, we think we might be able to, we don't know, but we might be able to reactivate them. But until then, uh, we need to start screening and yeah, all this other stuff about. Hmm. Well, good uh, luck avoiding. To, good luck to him. <laughs> That's for yeah. That. No, I, but I mean, it's yeah. it's there's just some exciting stuff going on. Oh, for sure. That's excellent. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Let's see what else. Anything else? You said two things. Do you remember the last? Yeah. One? one of the things that I really try and work with that I've uh, taken a lot from the podcast uh, and from obviously from from the Facebook group and stuff is. In the beginning, I really struggled uh, with managing my daughter. I felt like down a lot. Um, and obviously in the beginning, things aren't going well and you have to learn and you have to learn. But I've gotten to a point now where uh, I realized that 
the way I think about things, the words I use to describe what I do and, and, and what Madeline has, type 1 diabetes, um, affects my mind, my mindset uh, on a day-to-day basis. And I've one of the, what's like an example is I've chosen not to call type 1 a disease. I call it a chronic medical condition. Mm. And when you Google the word disease, it has a lot of negative connotations in it. But the word condition doesn't. But on a dictionary level, there's not a lot of difference between the words. Okay. Like the difference is chronic is, is something that has to go on longer than a year. Um, and a disease, that there are references to like, um, like some kind of malfunction in the body. So I choose to, and maybe it's thanks to the, I mean, I went down a big dark rabbit hole when Madeline got diagnosed. I was, I was with her in the hospital when I found your podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking like day two. Okay. Uh, after her diagnosis and just learning more and more and more about it and figuring out how her body works and how to make everything as good as it can be has made a big difference for my mental health. And, and I remember the doctor saying to me or the, the therapist in her, in her endo group, self care, take care of yourself. If you can't take care of yourself, if you're not taking care of yourself, then you're not taking care of your daughter as best as you can. Mm-hmm. And I just, I want to advocate for that because I think it's really important that first you, you choose the words wisely to just to explain what you're doing uh, for yourself and for others, but also take care of yourself in your relationship with other people and your relationship to yourself and in your relationship to type one. Yeah. I think it's really important. Well, I think the way you talk about it is the way you end up thinking about it. And so that's just makes sense to use words that are kind of kinder. It's kind of a, yeah, kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is kind of the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, like you use, you use that expression. Um, What is it? Something about expecting. You get what you expect. expect. Yes, exactly. And the words you use to describe what you expect is going to affect your mental health. Right. And if you, so if you say I have a disease, then that's a, that feels negative. And it has a negative connotation. Yeah, to it. And right. if you say, on the other hand, my daughter, like my daughter has a disease, my daughter has a chronic medical condition. That sounds very different. Even if you say it in the same tone, you, you think you have different associations to the word. Hmm. So yeah. I, I choose like, I've done some posts on my Instagram where I, I talk about like, how I see my daughter's uh, type one, where I talk about the words that I use. Uh, I, I just would like to advocate for people to think about that and think about what they, what they call it for themselves and in their heads and, and stuff. It makes a difference. You can see it in the Facebook group as well. How there's, so? there's patterns from different people. Well, there are some people who, who, um, did, did, it's definitely the word disease that's used the most in the Facebook group. Um, I hate this disease. Uh, mm-hmm. This disease is, is, I'm done with this disease, all these kinds of things. This disease is killing me. I started to realize that I myself was being a negative, negatively affected by those comments. And so I just, I would, I, I would actually like find myself scrolling over them. Like, okay, I don't, I don't want the negativism. I, I need something else. Yeah. And then I would see people post about we're we're getting this, we're making this work. We've got the upper hand now. And and I realized that that's what I I looked for and it made me feel better. Um, so you get what you get what you expect. Yeah. Kind of, like you said. Well, I try to I try to think of it like this and that everybody comes in at some different part of the journey and there are going to be some people who are just like been doing it for three months they don't understand it and they're overwhelmed they're like i hate this and you know there are going to be people who lived with it for their whole life and don't know don't understand it yet and they might feel the same way but if we let all those people together they'll just reinforce to each other that it's horrible and they can't figure it out blah 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 so you need other people there who are like hey you know i found out that this works or we've had a lot of success with this or try not calling it a disease and see if it doesn't make you feel like whatever your input is and i think Mm -hmm. that's how that's how the community aspect of it is so valuable 
you have to have people from every kind of, like I said, part on the journey. The problem is, is that some of them are such neophytes at, that it feels like what they're saying is so negative sometimes, but it's just because of where they're at in the process. It could be a bad day. Like I get it. Oh yeah. my God, have I had bad days? Yeah. Um, I put my, I almost put my fist through a wall one weekend because I was just freaking out. I couldn't get her blood sugars where I wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and, and, you know, that's where that Facebook group is absolutely invaluable. Yeah. I put a long post on there. This is all the, these are all the factors. This is everything I've done. I'm like three people. I can name them. Right? They're like virus. I was like, what? I didn't even think about that. Mm-hmm. And then two days later, so I upped their basil two days later, here comes the green snot. I was yeah. like, wow, That's this is fun. amazing. Thank you people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cause you're making yourself mental. I mean, you've, you've listed out every totally. possible thing in the world and they just like, Oh, you didn't think uh, of this. It's like when someone comes uh, Scott, along, you look at you look at my posts in there. Like, like I put everything down. Like my posts are long, like every single thing I, you can possibly think of. And they're yeah. like, yeah, virus. Oh, <laughs> you're, like, you're like, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. It, it really is lovely. Like it, it it's, it's yeah. just, you know, where else are you going to get that from? You yeah, know? no, exactly. And that's I, like, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a single father. I have my daughter 50% of the time. Um, at two o'clock in the morning, I don't have anybody to call, but mm. that Facebook group is always there. Yeah. Always. I can't tell you like dozens and dozens of times where the, it has saved my sanity going into the Facebook group, making a posting a question and getting specific answers from specific people. And I'm like, Oh God, thank you. I am completely proud of that group. It really is. Yeah. Even when it goes, As through, you should be. Oh, thank you. Even when it goes through growing pains or there's, you know, once, Every once in a while, someone comes in and they're a, they're just a mix of like lost and angry and drunk. And you're like, all right, well, and then you try to talk them down. You're like, hey, calm down. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, just hang out. Like, mm-hmm. you'll see the group's not like this. You'll, you know, and most people do. Like, as much as you think like, oh, I actually had a thought the other day. I said it out loud on the group. I was like, this space is so calm right now. Like, I really mm-hmm. think we transcended something. Like, we leveled up or something. It's, mm-hmm. it's fascinating how well it's running. And, um, mm-hmm. I mean, even though like, you know, once in a while, like even behind the scenes, like there's people who somebody helps me moderate the group and there are people who help me, um, you know, they're like group experts that, um, leave links for people like, Hey, you have a question about this. It might be in this episode and which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Actually, I need more of those people. Uh, but, mm-hmm. um, but like every once in a while, like privately we'll message each other and I'll be like, I think this lady's drunk. Does she seem drunk to you? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like, let's cut her a break here. I don't think she's having a good day. Um, it's, yeah. it's something else. Like we went through a whole, like we've gone through, we went through a wave where the group got very popular and um, some people tried to come into it and affect it. Like they wanted it. I think they saw the, the power of it and they wanted their message to be more brightly shown in there, which is even odd to me because I don't stop anybody from talking about anything. So people are in there talking about all different ways they eat, all different ways they manage. Like, you know, I I don't care. Like it's all good to me. Um, But it got to the point where it was oppressive and, you know, we had to put in a rule that you don't tell people how to eat. And then then you had to manage that rule. And it took, I'm not going to lie to you. It took a year. And now mm-hmm. it doesn't happen anymore. It's nope. just really fascinating. Like you can, you can keep a space like that valuable and um, loving without it going crazy. You just have to kind of just bump and nudge it once in a while in the right directions. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I live in in a country with an amazing uh, resources for type one management and care. We a year in or fifteen months in, whatever we are, we would not where we are without your podcast and without that group oh. that's just that's just a fact well thank you so, that's very nice of you to share with me i appreciate amazing. it i really do, i really do appreciate it um i mean it's a labor of love at this point it just really uh it takes up all my time and i don't mind it's just wonderful you're gonna leave an impressive uh library of, of information um 
or you, you are in a process. I kind of see it as like a wake from behind a boat, you know, it just keeps getting bigger and wider and wider. Um, keep going, can't stop it kind of thing. It's just going to reach further and further and help more and more people. And that's, um, wow. Hat off to you. Thank that's you. an amazing accomplishment in life. It's not many people who can, who can pull that off. Oh, well, you know, a, a decade or so ago, I just had, well, it's longer than that now. I just had a popular blog and I tried to get a company to um, bring everybody together because my first thought was all these like great bloggers are writing, but nobody knows about all of them. They know about one or two of them. We should put them in a centralized right. location. Like what if a company came along and just... I don't know, just subsidize the bloggers a little bit, pay them. And it's like, you know, so the, here, we want to use your content here in this, in a hub. And I pitched that idea to a couple of people and they're like, and I'm like, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, they're, they're trying to run a business. I was like, it would be amazing. Like you bring all the great voices together in one place and, you know, you could put your signage at the bottom, you know, whatever, you know, we support this space. Catalyst. Yeah. Catalyze growth. Yeah. That's kind of why you're trying. Yeah. Be, yeah. You know, I don't mind your capitalism if you don't mind us helping people. And nobody, mm -hmm. nobody was up for that. And I was like, all right. So then I moved along and I watched the space again. And it, everything still to me was too fragmented. I was like, this can't help anybody. Like, it'll help mm -hmm. the people who find it, but it can't find enough people. So it can't really on scale help anybody. And mm -hmm. that's when I thought, well, I could just keep having these conversations and this will be a centralized location for the information. Then again, I can't take credit for the Facebook thing. Like I knew it was a good idea. I just didn't do it. Like, I mean, any like marketing one Oh one for a podcast will tell you like have your own Facebook group. But mm -hmm. I just, I was like, I don't, know, I just don't really want to do that. It just seemed like a lot of work to me at the time. And mm -hmm. the truth is, is that most, if I'm being honest, most podcasts that start their own Facebook group, they don't become very popular. And then they're just, they languish. They have a couple of thousand followers and nothing comes of it. And it's a place where you post links to your new, you know, podcast episodes and nobody clicks on. And so I was just like, oh, it's going to go that way. I don't want to be bothered with it. And then enough mm -hmm. people came to me and they're like, we really need a place to talk about the podcast. I was like, well, if this many people are saying it, then there's a real desire and I'll put it up. It hasn't been up that long. I mean, maybe 2019, is that even right? Like, it, maybe it was 20, I don't remember. It's not that long ago. Wow, that is, that is young. That's, yeah. That's wow. And it, it grows 300 people, like, every six days. It's exponential. It's, 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 it's absolutely, like, there are days I'm like, this is insane. Like, I'll put up a, a post to welcome new people. I'm like, hey, there's 285 new people in here. Like, welcome. And but by, by the time yeah. the, the weekend passes and I look up again, I'm like, I got to make another one of those posts. I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh. And then, and then I see that as a positive thing because we're growing the hub. And then someone comes along and goes, oh, all these people are being diagnosed. It's so sad. I'm like, don't bum me out. I was happy about this. And, like, <laughs> and the truth is, it's not that that many more people are being diagnosed. It's that the, the, the page is that popular. It's attracting. The truth is, at thirty eight thousand people, or by the time your episode goes up, I mean, you know, maybe forty three, forty four thousand people by the time your episode goes up. Um, sure, yeah. It, it's not enough. It's not nearly no. enough. Like it's impressive compared to other Facebook groups. It's not impressive compared to the amount of people who have diabetes. Like you have no idea. Like there's a, a small part of me that was like, oh, Finnish people can't understand my English. Like I actually like. There was 30 seconds where I was like, can I translate it? Like, what am I yeah. missing here? You know? And what am I missing? Yeah. And the truth is, is that someone there is going to have to do it, you mm -hmm. know? And, and then, then how's that going to happen? Because it just doesn't work that way. Like it's a special unknowable mixture of things that end up working out. And I can no more take credit for them than I could tell you how to duplicate it. So it's you know and and i mean i find like everybody says like one of the phenomenal strengths of the podcast is the variation in the stories I, you hear all the time i love the after dark episodes well i do too i mean i love listening to them because mm -hmm. it makes me think wow <clears throat> people that have this messed up lives or backgrounds or whatever they can actually make this condition 
work. Like they can get it to work. Yeah. Um, they've been through really horrible things. Like there's, there's some stories on there that I was like, I was almost driving off the road. Like, this is crazy. How are these people going through? Mm. But they still make it work. They still move on. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that insanely much, like so much, but also just, the. Uh, I love listening to, because of my own situation, I love listening to stories by parents about their kids. I, I find uh, a few, like that's my kind of like tip of the iceberg of feeling of community you know, in, in your huge ocean of podcast stories. Oh, I'm glad. Um, I, I love it when an adult hears a parent's story and thinks, I got to call my mom. I didn't realize. Yeah. But yeah, you know, like I've I've gotten those notes so many times. Like, oh, I called my mom mm-hmm. and I thanked her for taking care of me when I had when I was younger. I didn't. I just never occurred to me. And, and yeah, I didn't understand. Yeah, and no reason it should. I mean, listen, it it never stops. I tell people, if if you were to sit down and ask me about like my beginning and all this, I'd tell you how I started the blog, and you know, I'd get a couple notes every month that said, "Oh, your blog is really helpful to my family." And now I don't even know how to count them because they come in from so many different areas. Like I just woke up my other, like I, I started thinking that you and I were done. And so I woke up my other computer and my Facebook group is in front of me. And there's a post here that's nine minutes old. Picture of a little girl, picture of her A1C, says my daughter eats anything she wants, whenever she wants. And these are our results. What a great surprise. I want to thank blah, 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 blah. Kids A1C is 6.6. The little kid. You know, and the truth is I could click on this and keep scrolling and it would just keep happening. And then I could jump over into my messages. I'm helping an adult. No one bug me. Okay. I'm just sharing this for the podcast, <laughs> but I'm helping, an, I'm helping an adult that I don't know over Instagram messages. And yeah. I have brought his care along exponentially in the last six months. And just by, he was just in a good head space. Wanted to help himself, reached out, said, hey, what do I listen to? I pointed him towards some episodes. And then he said, if I have questions, can I ask? And I was like, sure. And he just kept asking questions and I kept answering them as often as I could. And I mean, it's life changing. The guy's life is absolutely changed. And I mean, I just I'm scrolling here. It's like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It just goes on forever. So do you ever. Do you ever just go downstairs and like, do you have a blue cape in a closet somewhere that you can put on and run around <laughs> in the house with and do a little dance? I mean, can, can someone get you a cape? I don't have time for that, Jeff. I don't live in Sweden. I live in America where I have to make a bunch of money. <laughs> if I, wanna, I have to keep right. I have to, right. Well, that's and, and uh, joking aside, like for all the podcast does, if the podcast doesn't serve advertisers well, it'll disappear in five seconds. Like, Absolutely. That'll be it. Him. Like yeah. you, you would have to come along. You would have to come along and say to me, Scott, how much is it going to cost you to stay alive for the next 20 years and into retirement? I'll write you a check for that. Can you just make the podcast forever and don't put ads on it? And I'd go, yeah, sure. That's fine. Like, I'm not yeah. trying to get rich. I'm just trying to stay alive, you know? And so um, I could do that. But if the podcast doesn't make money, then my wife will look at me and immediately say listen strike one yeah either either get a job either get a job or strike one i i believe she yeah. already assumes i'm strike one just that we haven't actually <laughs> like swung the bat you know uh but but yeah. but still by the way all of your marriages are strike one you're just hanging in there so relax as you're judging jeff and so <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it's an extra pressure because i you know as i was talking to that management group the other day uh, the guy said you know well how many employees do you have and i was like <laughs> well i was like what i was like it's me <laughs> i'm like they're employee he goes you edit the show and i go yeah he goes you don't farm that out i was like no and he goes i, I said man i do like i set up the you know i set up the recordings i i do the it work like there was a moment last week where i had trouble with my internet i walked down to my wife i looked her in the face i'm like don't talk to me today and then i disappeared and <laughs> went back upstairs and fixed my internet problem because I had to have it fixed for the next day. And I'm the guy and, you know, like, and I don't care. Like, I love it. I think it works terrific, but there is a part of me, like, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I I love the advertising group that I put together and I'm proud of it. I think it's a good, solid group of advertisers, 
But I mean, I'd like to not have to spend my evenings reading ads and, you know, editing things together that didn't have to be unedited if I wasn't trying to insert an ad into it and stuff like that. But it's just how it works. And, and I'm okay. But you know, at the same, at the same time, you have like a feeling you have in Swedish, we call it a finger top feeling. You have a feeling for, for the dialogue, for the discussion. And, and it's all in your head. Like, I know you leave these episodes for a while and then you edit them and then you put it out. But through your work in your solitary work in your office. And, and now we've all seen pictures in the Facebook group of you sitting in your office and what it all looks like. I mean, I'm not sure you can lift that out and give it to somebody else and get the same product. Yeah, I really don't know because everybody's brain works differently. And some people are going to prioritize other things. Well, this episode is a little bit too long. Let's just cut it back 12 minutes. Yeah. I don't care about that. Like yours is long. I don't care. There's some that are short. I don't care. Somebody's going to like yours. I was approached by a person who said, I don't understand what you put up so much content. And I, and I was like, yeah, like, like here's, you know, here's a, here's a free bit of like information. Everybody's not going to love everything you do. So if you only put something up once a week, you run the risk of running for a full month of something someone didn't enjoy. And if you go that long, they're going to go find another podcast. So, I try to give people something like even if if I put four up this week and you like two of them, that's terrific. If you like all four, God bless. That's terrific, too. If you like one, that's great. But imagine if I put up those four and you didn't like any of them, but I spread them out over the next four weeks, you're gone. Yeah, I'd be gone. I wouldn't last two weeks. Of course you wouldn't. And at the same time, I know something you don't know as a listener, which is if I can keep you here long enough. Your A1C is going to go on the fives. Mm -hmm. I'm tricking you into taking better care of yourself. Nah, nah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, it's and, and, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and you know what? I'm expecting you to get my daughters at A1C in the fives. Yeah, right. Like, I have that expectation from listening to the podcast. Like, I know why I can get there. Yes, it's the podcast. And it was nice of you to say, and it's me. That's fine. But no, it's not at the same time. It's, it's repetition. It's hearing different stories told different ways and sometimes hearing the same story told a different way until one day your brain goes, oh, I get it. And then, mm -hmm. then you'll get into that situation where you'll just like, people ask questions. I'm not always right. I'm not saying I am, but people ask questions. I'm like, well, that's the answer. This is the answer to that. And there are times I don't even answer them online. I'm like, well, let them get to it. It'll be good for the group that's in the post right now. And I'll check back on it later and make sure it's going in the right direction. And it's just, I don't know. There's, there's a way to teach people without, without letting them know they're being taught. You know, one of the things that I really like about the podcast, I just want to share this is that, so I looked through the list. Okay. Start with the bold beginnings, do the pro tips, all that kind of stuff. But I was only six months into my daughter's journey. Right. Mm -hmm. I've gone back and re listened to them and I've gotten more out of the second listening than I did out of the first. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's so, anything though. I li listen, I listen to podcasts too. And I listen to radio. I'm a fan of radio. I have been my whole life. I mostly don't want music on when I'm solitary. I want to hear people talking and there's a way that good radio is delivered. Um, there's a feeling that it has. And as much as you like it, I don't care. One listen doesn't give you everything. I, I hear this so. from people sometimes in the Facebook group where they're like, I don't learn this way. I tried listening and nothing happened. And you really dig in. They listen to three episodes and their A1C didn't drop three points. And they're like, this doesn't work. I don't learn this way. Now, I don't discount that some people don't learn this way. I'm sure they don't. I, I have trouble learning by reading. So I, I understand that. But if you just powered through it and just kept listening it would stick in your head in ways you wouldn't even expect. I've tried telling the story in the podcast. Jeff, you've maybe heard me tell you. My senior year of high school, I um, had to take a psychology elective. And it was right after lunch. And uh, I was sleepy at that time of day. So I would go into my right. psychology class and I'd go to sleep every day. Like every day. <laughs> I just didn't. I never yeah. paid attention once. To the point where on the last Second to last day of the class, there was a final. It was like a half-year class, so it was still halfway through the year, but it was the second to last day. 
We go in, and I'm like, oh, the final. I'll take the final. Go to sleep. And um, my a very good friend of mine reaches over, and he shakes me. And I remember waking up and looking up, and he said, don't you think you should at least take the final? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah he's right. So I like I, I literally sat there, like braced myself. I was like, slap my eyes, like, do it. Stay awake. Do this. And uh, by the way, now, <laughs> fun aside, turns out I think my iron's been low my whole life. So everybody should have felt bad for me, but never, not the point. So I woke, <laughs> I woke myself up and I took the final. And the next day we come in, it's our last day of class. And there's a sullen man, a beaten man at the front of the room. He is questioning his existence. I can see it on his face. And we sit down and he says, yeah, I got the finals graded. Almost like you, I hear you, mother. Here's your and um and he goes yeah. uh he just he's mumbling and he goes uh anybody want to guess who got the highest grade and everybody's like guessing people and everything i put my hand up and he's he's like yeah i'm like me right it was me wasn't it and he goes yep it was you son of a bitch and he put it on my desk <laughs> he was so pissed and 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 sad and and he should have been by the way his life is meaningless that's what this moment is teaching him he he doesn't even need to be yeah. there you know all the all the effort was in vain. <laughs> yeah. So all I'm saying is, I wasn't sound asleep. Some days I just had my head down. <laughs> and, That's right. And and if you so if you listen to the pro tip series a couple of times, your A1C is going to go backwards because you don't you'll remember things you don't realize you're remembering. And yeah. and I think that's just and, true. And, and every single time you hear a news story, it's told with a little bit of a different nuance, and eventually the right nuance is going to hit your brain the right way and it's going to stick Yeah, Jeff, instead of, instead of it being like Teflon, like it could be in all the other days. Right. Jeff, listen, it, this might feel like an exercise to some people and me explaining why I'm terrific, but it's not. I'm trying to explain to you why I think you should listen to the podcast and yeah. why is it at the end of a long episode? That's also purposeful. If you're still here, you're invested. You might actually listen to me right now. Mm -hmm. Like that's why, You've never heard me at the beginning of an episode say, hey, if you're really enjoying this podcast, leave a uh, five-star rating and a review where you listen because it helps other people find the podcast. I say that at the end of the podcast because I'm now I'm right, talking right. to people who care. You, you know, And right. so I'm talking to people right now who I think care. Listen to the podcast. Mm -hmm. You'll get better at taking care of your diabetes. You might not even realize it's happening. And if you can't believe that, I'd go read the thousands of reviews that – are trying to turn me into one of those little religious candles, um, which is a, just a yeah. private joke between me and Isabel. And she's like, they're going to put you on a candle one day. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> do, do you have those? I, those I buy that candle if you had a blue cape on. Do you? Just make sure you've got a blue cape on your candle. <laughs> I'm always like, never say this in front of anybody. It's ridiculous. And she's like, it's, you know, but do you know what in the grocery store candles in the religious, there's like always like a, and just everybody's grocery store have kind of like an ethnic food section. And in that food section, there's a few candles to burn at meals. And they have pictures of like popes and saints on them and things like that. Is this a thing that only happens here? Yeah. Okay. Because I, I don't know what you're and, talking anyway, about. <laughs> anyway, she's like, they're going to put and, – and, and Isabel's French. And I can hear her French accent when she's typing to me, which is ridiculous. And um, <laughs> and I hear her saying like, they're going to put you on a candle. And I'm like – and I'm not doing her accent well at all. But, but anyway, that's not the, the point is that for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. And some of the things that Jeff's pointed out and some of the things I've said, I got a system and it works. So just put your earphones in and I don't know, be healthy, give it, give be it healthier. Yeah. Like give it a shot, like give it a real shot. Sure. You know, that pro tip series the other day I thought about, I thought about sending it out to have it like, like corrected like audio corrected because it was older when i made it like i've i've thought about putting it out in its own podcast taking it out of this podcast and putting it somewhere else so people can find it easier like it's it, it's golden you listen to that and your a1c is not in the low sixes then listen to it again and it will be it's just and it will be yeah. yeah that's all i don't know all right jeff you're terrific it's late where you are um i appreciate you doing yeah. this very much i i just want to say though i've been looking at my daughter's graph for we're going into two hours here right Okay. She has been floating between 4.9 and 6.2 for the last two hours. Good for you. Perfect. That's wonderful. Perfect. Yeah. I'm going to sleep well tonight. Good for you. I did that, Jeff. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just well, fun. you did eventually. <laughs> I, was just, I was just fucking around at the end there a little bit. But, um, like, 
<laughs> I actually get notes from people and they're like, look what you did. And I'm like, you, I didn't do that. I was like, you did that. That's a lot of hard work, understanding diabetes, putting into practice, you know, all that stuff like that's your, don't give, don't give that win away to me. You know, that's a, that's a thing you did, Jeff, you know, that's really, really something else. So good for you. It's well done in, yeah. in, in a short amount of time too. So congratulations. Thank you. Of course. You. Uh, hold on for me one second. Okay. All right. A huge thanks to Jeff, Omnipod, and the Contour Next Gen. Contour Next. ContourNext.com slash juicebox. Omnipod.com slash juicebox. Jeff doesn't have a link. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be... Wait a minute. That was too quick. Don't forget to check out the private Facebook group. Sorry. Uh, Juicebox Podcast Type 1 Diabetes. Tell people about the Pro Tip Series. Share the show with people. Don't forget to subscribe and follow in your app. Please, please, please turn the automatic downloads on. And um, what else? Oh, I hope you have a good holiday. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.